You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. It's hard to believe we're in the second to last week before we move into the, there's one more teaching on the series on Joseph um, that goes before uh, next week. And, and as, we, as we lean in towards the end of this story, we recognize and we understand that there is this reality and this tension that happens between Genesis 37 and Genesis 50. And it tells the story of this young man named Joseph, who is this kind of forerunner of Christ. He has this character that is impeccable. And he really, um, he's just he is kind of this bedrock for character. And we've looked at him, we've understood him, but in some ways we have to look differently today and we have to understand that something goes on within this story when Joseph's brothers come to him and bow down and and things begin changing. We have to recognize that really what's going on is God's at work revealing where he, in Joseph's absence from his family, has done some changing of character in people. So we're going to look tonight at Genesis 44. And in Genesis 44, we're going to read a chunk of the, of the beginning of that scripture, and then we're going to read the latter part of that chapter as well. But what I want to do tonight is just kind of lean in on this idea of who you were. I don't know about you, but uh, there's no better way to find out what you've learned than a good test. You, you take a test, you learn and you grow and you keep progressing and testing yourself. And the reality for us is we were something. And we've grown, hopefully, into something better. We've grown and we've matured in some different ways. I know this. For me, I was a miserable test taker. I could not take tests to save my life. It was awful. I, from a very young age, they'd put the test in front of me. I would just lock down. I would freak out and I would eagerly achieve a failing grade because I couldn't seem to get over that. And it frustrated me and I never really felt like it was a reflection of what I had learned in the class because the test caused such anxiety in me and it really pushed me and it frustrated me. And it's something I can remember and if I think about it for a minute, I can almost go back there emotionally and think about those times. And really what we're gonna talk about today is a test that is full of anxiety, of fear, and of this trepidation among the brothers of Joseph. We're gonna see them put to the test today because I think the question we have to answer is, how does Joseph know once his brothers have come to him, how does he know if his brothers have changed? Remember, his brothers beat him, they assaulted him, they threw him into a dry well, then they pulled him out and sold him. They weren't the best family. They were horrible. They did terrible things to him. And I think he wants to know, Before I help you, before I reveal who I am, I want to know that you changed. And so Joseph has a test for them. Joseph is going to put them to the test. He is going to find out if the character of those men has changed, matured, and grown. Here's the story. Genesis 44. It says this. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Remember, the steward, kind of like the chief butler or the chief um, servant of Joseph's house. Joseph had him over for lunch in the chapter before. He, he fed them well, he treated them well. And it's a, he said this to his steward, fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver into the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one. That would be Joseph's youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin was born to Rachel. Rachel had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. So, so Joseph saying, put the, sack, the silver cup into the sack of Benjamin's along with the silver for his grain. And his servant did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, go after those men at once. And when you catch up to them, say this, why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from uh, and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. So the steward goes and when he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to the steward, why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver that we found inside the mouth of our sack last time. 
They're pleading their case. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants, and I love the kind of hyperbole and emphasis here, if any of us is found to have it, he will die and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. That is confidence in the courtrooms, my friend. That is a confident statement. But notice they say, if the person who has it dies and the rest of us become slaves. Very well then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever's found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free. Don't, don't advance yet. The rest of you will be free from blame. I kind of love this, and this is kind of the humanity in Scripture. Do you notice what he says? The brother says, if anybody has it, they will die, and we will become slaves. And then the guy says, very well, just as you said. And then he changes the rules. I just think that's obviously like, yeah, just like you said. Whoever's found to have it will be my slave, and the rest of you can go home. That's not what they agreed to. But anyways, um, each of them quickly lowered their sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's bag. At this, they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and they headed back to the city. That is an interesting twist on the story of Joseph. They headed back into the city. Today we need to take a look at one of the brothers, Judah. This brother really matters if you know anything of the Christian faith um, about the history of Jesus. Jesus is known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the namesake for that tribe in Israel, the, the tribe of Judah, and Jesus is of the bloodline of Judah. And we're going to talk about Judah, and we're going to talk about some of the unsavory and kind of not good bits about his life, and we're going to look at him and understand who this Judah really is. First of all, when we talk about Judah as a sinner, let's just open kind of the, the case file on this. First of all, Judah was a really bad guy at being a brother. He beat his brother up. He threw him in a pit, and it was Judah's idea to say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Maybe we should make some money off Joseph. Let's sell him. That was Judah's idea. I always think it interesting, the name Judah and the name Judas and the sell of, selling of a human for money. I mean, Scripture loves to echo on itself. So we see that Judah's a really bad brother. He's just not, well, he's not a good guy, is he? He struggles with jealousy. He hates Joseph. He hates him with all his heart. He beat him, threw him in a pit, and sold him. He lied to his dad for decades about what he had done. Judah is a liar. He lacks integrity. And Judah has this issue with not being able to kind of keep himself in check when it comes to his own rage against somebody. Look what he did to Joseph. Look at how the lie carried on for almost a whole generation. We see Judah being this person who struggles with jealousy, maybe a low self-confidence, but this hatred. And then we see that Judah is a real failure in life. He's not just a sinner and a really bad sinner at that, but he's kind of a loser. And here's why. We talked about what a bad brother he was, but how would you like to have Judah for a son? How would you like to be dad to one of those? As a brother, he was miserable. As a, as a son, he was horrible. He was horrible. He sold off one of his father's sons, his favorite son, and then he lied about it for over 20 years. Judah was a really bad son. But here's the thing we didn't really talk about yet. Judah was a lousy um, father. And it's pretty clear in scripture. His sons lacked character. Judah had three sons. And Judah's first two sons were older, and then there was a trailer, you know, the one that was born a little later in life. And uh, the first two sons, the oldest son gets married. He is given to, his wife given to him is named Tamar. Judah's son marries Tamar, and he does what is wicked in the eyes of God. It says this in Genesis 38. And he does what's wicked in the eyes of God, and God puts him to death. Judah's next son in line was given Tamar. And you may think, whoa, that's kind of weird and crossing a boundary, but it's not. In scripture, there's this thing called leveret marriage. This woman, Tamar, would have had no way to make money for herself, to feed herself or care for herself without a husband because she was considered property. Don't get mad at me, I didn't make the rules. But that's how it would have gone. And so he would, the, the second brother would have been given Tamar to carry on his brother's name. He would have become 
the next brother's wife. And this brother also did what was wicked in the eyes of God. And God put him to death as well. So Judah, being savvy, noticing his sons are perishing under the umbrella of this black widow, decides to say, my youngest son is too young to be married. I will give you to him once he's older. The Tamar goes back to her family and waits with the proposal in tow. And eventually she notices the boy has grown up. She's not been given. So she does something pretty wily. She dresses up in the garb of a woman of the night. We get that? Okay, I'm trying to help young ears here. A woman of the night, right? She dresses up and she would have had a face covering. She sits at the city gates and she waits for Judah to walk by during the sheep shearing season. It's not easy to say. And she, she waits for him, she spots him, and she calls him over. Hey, come here, come see me. Judah, we now find out, is a really lousy husband because he goes and spends some time with said woman of the night, thinking her just a typical lady at the gate. Judah has two sons in Scripture, in the bloodline of Jesus, and this is how it says it. Judah has two sons named Perez and Hezron, and their mother was Tamar. Anybody else feel a little bocky? Anybody else figure out dad, granddad, what just happened? This guy's not good at family. He's a failure as a brother, as a son, as a father, now as a husband. He has failed on time after time after time. He has done what was wrong in the eyes of God continually. But Judah has this change come over him. We don't know why. Scripture leaves it deliberately opaque. We're not able to grab onto it, but we recognize that Judah is actually the spokesman that frees up Benjamin to come with him on the second journey to Egypt. Judah speaks up and talks to his dad, and then it's Judah who speaks up to Joseph. Instead of just listening to my words, let's go back to Scripture and see what it says. Judah speaking, Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we can't go down. And Judah says, we, but it's him talking. We can't go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us, will we go. We cannot see this man's face. The man was Joseph, is the the Egyptian official, unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, he has surely been torn to pieces. And I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, Benjamin, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the, but now listen, this is now Judah speaking to Joseph. So now, if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound with the boy's life, and he sees that Benjamin, the boy, isn't there, it will kill him. He will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Put in whatever language of any adjective to make it horrible. He will die as sad as possible. Your servant, Judah, saying, I guaranteed the boy's safety to my dad. I said, if I don't bring him back to you, I will stand before you all the days of my life and bear the blame before you. Now, please let me remain here as your slave in place of Benjamin and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my dad if the boy is not with me? No, no, don't let me see that misery that would overtake my dad. Do you see the test? Do you see how how all of a sudden Judah, who has been such a doorknob, he has done everything wrong, hits this one out of the park. 
He does so good on this. He is put to the test. And what I can tell you is this. He didn't just suddenly pass the test. Something has changed in Judah. The work has already been done in him over the years. Maybe the lie to his dad about what happened to Joseph rotted inside of him and he couldn't bear it anymore. And he had to reconcile his character and his failings to the high calling of God. I don't know, but it does tell me this. When you read that scripture where Judah says, no, I will not go back without my little brother. You can have my life and give his, give my little brother back to his dad. Don't you think those are words Joseph longed to hear as the brother who was beaten, thrown away, and sold? See, the test shows the work that's already been done. No teacher breaks out a test and is like, all right, guys, today, We're learning fractions, which by the way, fractions, Darth Vader in my life, pretty much the same thing. Um, It's horrifying, I'm bad at fractions as a dyslexic. It just didn't go well. The only thing that helped me with dyslexia is, you know, 53 and a 35, you get out of a ticket. But um, other than that, it's rough, right? And, um, And so I look at like, at this test, no teacher would be like, fractions, we're starting them today. Here's the test. That would be a bad teacher. That would be cruel, you'd be like, um. Mrs. Cooks, we didn't learn fraction silence. You know, that's not good teaching. You learn something and then you're tested on it. And what happens in this is we see that he was tested. There's another way to relate this. In World War II, there was this uh, group of resistors to Nazis. They were known as the White Rose. Hans and Sophie Skoll were a young brother and sister my favorite historian in the world wrote this. Um, she worked on it as her thesis for her, her graduate degree, her undergraduate degree. And she talked about Hans and Sophie Skoll and also this woman named Diet Iman, who actually was a Dutch lady. She worked with Corey Ten Boom, uh, who wrote The Hiding Place and actually lives in Grand Rapids. We got to meet her. And my favorite historian is Erica. But um, the, we got to meet her in Grand Rapids after she wrote this. And, um, and she talks about these people who resisted the Third Reich when the Third Reich had a throat hold on Europe. When it was deadly to resist, these people resisted. And what we found, or what she found, is that you never suddenly meet a challenge and overcome it. It's a thousand little choices that led them to resist. They knew what they believed. They knew about the conflict inside of them and they would not follow the line. So they did little things subversively to undermine the Third Reich. Hans and Sophie Skoll worked all of their short lives against the Third Reich. And they served with passion and with love beyond their years. And they did it because they knew what was going on in the Third Reich was wrong. And so they made a thousand little choices that nobody else ever saw, but paid dividends to the world because they undermined the Third Reich. They chose what they would do. And finally, when the moment of crisis came, and they were arrested, and they could refute everything and say, hey, we're sorry, and maybe get out because they were kids. They stood up for their beliefs, and they resisted the Third Reich at peril for their own life. And the day they were headed off to execution, their mom came out to them, and she handed Sophie a piece of candy. And she handed it to her. And Sophie, Sophie said, now think of it, this girl is on her way to die. And her mom said, would you like this piece of candy? I just, I can't even think about it as a dad. And she takes it and she said, thank you, mom. I haven't eaten yet today. Like her mind, she was so clear on who she was that when the test came, she passed it with flying colors because a thousand decisions before it helped make the final decision. That's how tests go. We don't suddenly just turn over a new leaf. We have to learn the lesson the hard way. We have to go through the process of engaging what's in front of us and dealing with the character flaws, the willful sin and the things inside of us that resist doing the difficult thing and embrace doing the easy thing. The reality for us is the lesson isn't to respond better next time. That is not the lesson. The lesson is to begin now, now. Presently, how do we engage right now? Remember I told you how bad of a test taker I was? 
I went to seminary, which still wasn't good at school. Um, it's a three-year program. I got through in nine, so there's little victories everywhere. And, um, but it was already kind of a telltale sign. I took first grade twice, so I'm used to repeating some things. And, um, and I, I worked my way through seminary, but I would still buckle under tests. A test would be put in front of me, and I'd be like, I don't know. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. Oh, <laughs> but I couldn't. I just would lock up. I just couldn't do it. And I remember a teacher gave me an oral exam one time. He just said, I'm gonna have you talk through it, my Hebrew teacher. And I did great. And he's like, you know this. I'm like, I know, but my writing hand doesn't know it. It's like it's connected to a squid over there. It just doesn't work. I can't do it. So I had to learn a system by which I could take a test to show that I had engaged the lesson time after time after time. And so I learned a way to take a test. I would sit down, I would allow my blood pressure to get to roughly 340 over 280, and um, I would panic, I would sweat, and I would smell bad, and then I would be like, okay, and I would go through the questions. I wouldn't read a question that was over about a sentence long, and I wouldn't dwell on it. I'd be like, that I have no idea. Not you either. About number six, my brain's kind of calming down. I see one I know. Usually number six to eight, I'd be like, oh, I know that. I'd write the answer in. I'd go down, I'd write another one. By then, my blood pressure's dropped to human levels. I'm, I'm coming back down to earth. I'm calming down. I go back to the top. Everything's calming down. I just get a couple wins under my belt. Sometimes I'd be way down the test. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be rough. And I'd start to panic, but I'm like, just get one right. And by the end, I'd be able to loop back and do it. That was, that was the lesson I learned. Learn the material, work hard at the time, but also... Prepare for the test. The reality for you and I is that we are gonna face tests in our lives and it's gonna reveal one thing, the same thing it revealed in Judah. It's gonna reveal our character. It's gonna reveal our character and our character is the thing that matters. The thing that matters in this is that the lesson is always given by the master and the master is an important con conversation for the church to have because the master is God and the test isn't for God. He already knows all. The test is to see what the student has grown in. How has our character changed? What do we do with the results of a test given by our master knowing that there is nothing God won't do to transform us and bring us closer to him. It means this, we have to assume the best of God's intentions, that he's pulling us back to test us. God isn't sitting up in heaven thinking, you know what I need to hear today? I need to hear Eric Folker's got an F, so I'm just gonna give him a test and watch him bomb it. <laughs> That's not how God works. God is for us. He is to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, knowing we, like Judah, are pretty broken people. We're pretty messed up. If Judah can be in the bloodline of Christ, I think you and I could be saints because that guy's messed up and so are we. And the hope for this is that the master is doing something that, well, I think the foundry was kind of named after. Now, I don't know if anybody here's ever been in a foundry, but a foundry is a dirty, filthy, filthy environment. It's super hot because you're melting metal. It's super dusty. I don't know why all the dust, but there's tons of dust. And um, it's just filthy. You take something raw and you put it into a crucible, you melt it down, you purify it, and you make something good. I'm like beams over the ceiling or big beams that go over the freeways, right? They get rolled out into sheets of steel. They get made into something. A foundry breaks something down with great heat and intensity and makes it purposeful, so much like us. God, this church is not here to be a pretty little cathedral. We're supposed to be messy. It's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to be raw. It's supposed to change us from who we were into who he is. God has a purpose for our lives. The test from the master is showing us areas of growth that we have grown in and transformed in, but also areas we need to grow into. God reveals that through the foundry pr process. Here's what I know. Having taken metal shop and been the foreman in high school my freshman year, I'm an expert, um, we would melt down aluminum and we would put it into molds and then we would pour it into this thing called the pig and it would make, um, not a real pig, 
but that might have been awesome. Um, so, so we'd put it into these, these big cast iron things, and it would make a bar. And after you melt down aluminum enough times, by the time you pour the excess in, if it's been melted down and slagged enough times, which slag is where you take a screen and you pull the impurities off the top, even aluminum will show my reflection in it if I purify it enough. What do you think Jesus is doing in the foundry? He's breaking us down. He's putting us to the test over and over, removing impurities so that one day when we walk out those doors, what do people see but the very reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ? A test is to make Christ revealed through us. The test is to break down things in us that aren't reflective of God and to remove it so that the image of God burns brightly in front of this community. I love the fact that in the bloodline of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a guy who is the world's worst brother, worst son, worst father, and worst husband. And we say Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah because what Judah tells us is this, where we are is never the ending. We are always called upwards in God. God transformed that man's character. And if Jesus Christ has been transforming our lives, it's going to be as dramatic as a change in Judah. We have to live into who God called us, not who our past called us. We have to be owned by the one who is transforming us, the one who has called us to reflect his image in this world. The church isn't supposed to preach at the world. It's supposed to reflect God to the world. And the only way that happens is not by our good moralistic lives. It happens by us being tested, broken down, melted down, slagged, and reflective of him who did it first. The Lord Jesus Christ was put to the test. And when the test came, he didn't fail. He obeyed the Father. What will we do with the same opportunity? Pray with me. Lord, thank you for a story like Judah. Thank you that it's so messed up. Thank you, God, that, um, that this guy who was really, really bad at life and really, really lost, thank you that he was able to be transformed because you, God, by your spirit, called him to yourself. Thank you for the years of silence in Judah's life where he had to choose differently. Thank you, God, for tests because your tests are not cruelty to us. The test is not for the master, it's for the student to reveal transformation and growth. Thank you, God, that we are growing from glory to glory. We are being transformed not by our power, but by the power of your spirit. So we ask, God, that tonight we would be given a fresh dose of courage to face the tests that come, that we would be people who reflect well the one who we claim, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose love for us can only be described as a reckless abandon. With no regard for himself, Christ went to the cross on our behalf, and for that we thank you. Thank you, God, that you know every test we face. You faced it yourself. And you have called us not to be ourselves only more so, but you've called us to be made by the power of the Spirit into the image of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray, make us courageous for the test. Help us experience in some measure the love of Christ in this place tonight that would make us not only eager for the test, but willing to stand up and face what lies ahead so that people may recognize your reflection in our lives and they may see and know that they too are loved. They are not called to be perfect. They are called to be redeemed. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming broken people like us with such a love. Pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, I'm gonna invite you. Stand up, sing with me. Share a moment with me here before we go. Anybody here, and you don't have to raise your hand, I I know it's true, have a sin you've committed or something that's gone on, you're like, I will never again make that mistake. You're never gonna do it again. And like the next day, the next week, you're like, never again. And then by the end, you're like, I'm a loser, I'm gonna do it, I'm broken. And we, we as Christians excuse ourselves quite a bit. And we think, you know, I think God just knows I'm really messed up. He does know you're messed up. That's why he gave you his Holy Spirit. Listen to the conviction. Let it convict you. Be desperately uncomfortable with the sin in your life because the things that separate us from God create character that is corrupted. I know this. My parents taught me to ride a bike when I was a little boy, and um, I had a sweet, a sweet Schwinn with the long banana seat, the kind of chopper handlebars. I was awesome, spent a lot of time alone. And, um, 
I remember my dad holding the back of the seat and he's like, come on. And I was like pedaling away. This is before bike helmets. We just had concussions. And, um, and so I'd be riding. I'd be like, are you there? He's like, you're good, Eric. I'm like, all right, pop. And I'd be riding like, you know, just pedaling like mad to keep it going. And I'd be like, okay. And I remember uh, like noticing his voice seems further away. And I look back, I'm like, what are you doing? And I instantly use my face as a brake on the pavement. And I was like, oh, you abandoned me. But he didn't. He just didn't want me to be 15 going, all right, buddy, time for school. (laughs) How stupid does that look? No, I'm serious. How bad, like if your neighbor was like, all right, big fella, and helping him out, and they're like, thanks, dad, and they rode off. But we as Christians refuse to grow up. We refuse to let our character become mature and complete, lacking in nothing. We justify, well, that's just me. It's not supposed to be just you. It's supposed to be him. We don't want to be Christians that need to be patty caked out the door. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Go be like Jesus by the power of his spirit. Quit justifying what God doesn't excuse. God has great expectations for the things his spirit fills. Go live like it. As you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn, may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is time for the church to leave the building. Have a great night. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.